Um, so we wanted to go over four really fun collaborative activities and focus on collaboration today because a lot of you might be virtual. Uh, and so uh, that's an, an added challenge, but doesn't mean that it's going to get in the way of fun uh, this hour of code. So uh, without further ado, let's introduce our guests. Oops. Eric, who are you? Hi. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Eric. I'm um, the co-inventor uh, of Makey Makey, along with a person named Jay Silver. We created the Makey Makey Invention Kit, and I'm also currently a member of the team that develops Scratch. There's the Scratch cat. Awesome, and we have Dr. Splat on the line as well. Hi, I am a uh, also a Scratch Team member alumni, and uh, I'm Amon Milner when I don't go by Dr. Splat. Mm -hmm. I um, helped start the Unruly Studios that gave you the splats from my position at Oldland College of Engineering, where I am also a professor of computing. And if you open up the Scratch Sprite library, Amon is a Sprite. Most people can't say that. I'm not a Sprite. I'm on the Sprite. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I think I'm still a Sprite through three versions from that unsuspected picture taken before. Are you standing was... like this? I yep. feel like I might know which one's you. Uh huh. Uh, one of the other one? Scratch, one, yeah, one of the other Scratch <laughs> co-inventors um, took a picture of me and said, "Do something silly." It was before Scratch <laughs> was a thought, and she placed that picture in as a Sprite, and so it wasn't. Yeah. That's great. I've used your Sprite. It's a good one. <laughs> awesome. So uh, everybody, write us in the chat. Um, what did you do last year for Hour of Code? Do you uh, do a code.org activity? Uh, use Makey Makey, use Scratch, use Splats? Um, let us know in the chat. Looks like Sandra's going to go back and try and find your Sprite I'm on. <laughs> We, when we start keeping stats of sprites, I was um, a very um, highly used sprite because my name starts with the letter A, so I was one of the first choices. And my diving position made it easy for me to plunge into a river and things like that. So people found a lot of fun with that. So I did well on the splatalytics, on the analytics of the early scratch sprites. All right. Got some awesome ideas here. Um, yeah, Makey Makey's, Unplugged Activities, which are great. Modules from out the Hour Code website, Scratch, Code.org. Somebody said something about, oh, binary uh, bracelets in buddy classrooms with 720 students. Wow, that's a lot of students in one room. All right. And one last question. Uh, what does a successful Hour Code uh, look like for you? And we can put that in the context of uh, this year. What are you hoping to get this hour of code? Engage students. Yes. <laughs> That's number one. That's probably really difficult. I mean, my daughter is in middle school and I hear sometimes the teacher, she, did she doesn't like her headphones and she's here like in the other room. So I have um, very loud coworkers. That's what I call them. But, um, I often hear the teachers like, come on, y'all, give me something. I'm over here and I'm talking to you. I need you to respond. I need you to, you know, like they just, I know it's got to be hard if you're all virtual versus somewhat hybrid. I think at that point it's hard too, but it's a different kind of hard. Yeah, absolutely. Got fun sounds like something we all need right now. Something yeah. fun and somehow being collaborative in this uncollaborative COVID world. Yep. And choices for kids too. That's a good mm -hmm. one. The name Hour of Code, you know, is uh, is intended to say you can get into the coding community using a smaller amount of time than one would expect and just give some time to it, give it a try. And I think a successful Hour of Code activity has people feeling like I can't stuff this into the size of the activity, whether it's 60 minutes or 90 or whatever unit you're going to use. And the spillover is something that people are looking forward to. And um, so I think that is like, you know, you get the taste and more people that got the taste look forward to 
having more hours of code. That's what success is. And yeah, uh, I like that. So Colleen said, successful hour of code leads to a whole year of code. This yeah. is all of our secret mission is we're, we're luring you in with hour of code, but we really want you to do a whole year of code. <laughs> I think that's really the trick, right? Like it's called hour of code to really, it's supposed to be an enticing thing, but none of us expect the hour of code to stop. We want you to go beyond the hour of code and keep coding, so for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And how will hour of code look different this year during COVID? I think this is a question for, um, well, for everybody on the line, but also for Amon and Eric specifically, you know, we designed these sort of four activities to work virtually. Um, you know, what's this year? How's this year going to be different? Uh, so the hour of code panel will look different this year because uh, mm -hmm. last year we had an opportunity to share a screen. We were in the same room. This year we're collaborating in our own separate rooms. So many hour of codes will be people that would otherwise like to be together, but looking for creative ways to collaborate at a distance. And so that means that the features that are brought to the fore in the platforms that people are using from splats to makey makeys to scratch and others will probably be things that are brought more into this year's hour of code that may not have been explored last year. Totally, it's the online collaboration features and we're seeing on scratch an incredible spike of, of the activity of kids communicating and collaborating with each other um, on the website since they can't do that in person so much anymore. Um, and since the Scratch community is a safe place for kids to interact and create together, um, there's a lot going on there, very exciting. Um, and one of the challenges, of course, is not everybody has the physical materials, the kits, um, et cetera. And so we're having to come up with creative workarounds. Um, and that's some of what we're gonna talk about today. Absolutely. And but before we get started, <laughs> Colleen. Yeah, we're gonna talk about what a Makey Makey is. So I'm Colleen from Makey Makey and I write our content and do all our digital stuff. And um, you've probably seen me a lot if you go to our webinars too. So um, and I actually am bringing one of the projects here today that that I think can be really fun collaboratively. That's not something you would have done as a teacher if you weren't um, if you were all together in school. So I think that's, to me, that's one of those fun challenges, like thinking how we can do that. So Makey Makey is a device that allows you to connect your computer to everyday stuff. Um, and that's what makes it really fun. Um, but it's also been a little bit of a challenge, right? Because right now, uh, Makey Makey is, uh, is something that you may or may not be able to use with your kids. But it's an invention kit focused on getting kids to be creative because we believe that the world is a construction kit and everyone can embrace their own creative confidence by learning through play. So play is fun. So we'll talk some today about some really fun ways uh, to use Makey Makey even if you don't have one. Um, if you want to go to the next slide because it kind of shows the, uh, the keyboard thing. Uh, and also how you can connect it to everyday stuff. So what you do is you take alligator clips and you plug it to any old thing that's actually conductive and now you control your computer with bananas or, um, or I'm sorry, I was trying to think of what the other ones were, drawings or plants, and I think that's what makes it fun. So um, anything that you connect one side from earth to the key press is going to now work like it's the computer key. So it looks like a Nintendo controller because that's what it actually controls is your up, down, left, right. Um, and on the back, there's more inputs, but we don't see too many people using those, but those are WASDFG, which are common controls for many old school computer games. Eric was gonna say something. Oh, I was just gonna say, I wonder, you know, could you turn your turkey into a, into a down arrow or uh, your stuffing into an up arrow? Hmm. You or could you could turn your, controller. you could have your turkey say ow when you carve it. <laughs> nice. Interactive <laughs> Thanksgiving feast. Very good. But I think one of the most fun things to do with Makey Makey is drawing because almost everyone has a pencil. Um, and you do have to make your marks really dark and neat. So one activity today, I actually do have a drawing to share um, how that works. And I, uh, I love this drawing just because it kind of shows you can actually tap each Makey Makey key. Um, and you don't have to use Makey Makey with Scratch. You can actually use it with anything. It works with a keyboard key. So you can use Make Code Arcade. 
Um, you can use random apps other people have created. And one of my new favorite um, coding platforms that I'm trying to help myself learn is P5JS, which is actually a really good um, coding tool uh, for, for even kids because I tried to learn processing, which was really difficult for me, but P5JS was a little bit easier. So if you can learn to code it, you can use Makey Makey with it. And that's what kind of makes it really fun. Nice. You, you want to go to the, Eric gets to explain input and output, how the banana piano works. Oh, okay. Um, so the Makey Makey, as Colleen was saying, pretends it's a keyboard, but you make your own keys. So here, there's a picture of this person who made a drawing and the each little part of that drawing becomes a key. So like that little squiggle is like a left arrow. And so when you press your finger on that little squiggle, the computer thinks you pressed the left arrow key. And then you can load up a web page, say, that plays musical notes when you press your keyboard keys. Or you could load up a, a, a game or um, uh, basically anything else that you do with your computer that responds to key presses. You could use it with a word processor. You can start and stop videos. You can, you can do all kinds of things uh, uh, where you make a new input using physical materials for any output on the computer. Yeah, and I like to, when I, when I use Makey Makey with kids, I like to have one kid be the programmer and the other kid be the, uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, the software and hardware. So one kid is actually coding the software, so he is the programmer, and then the other kid might be working on the physical elements, which I still think would be doable in, in what we have with COVID. If they're in person. And one of my if favorite things person. is always to complete a circuit through a high five, so two people making skin to skin contact can trigger a key, but maybe this is not the year to do that one. So right. We'll be able to do those <laughs> human synthesizers again, where you tap different people's noses and they play different musical notes, but not right now. You can, you can with your family. So I have seen some homeschooling moms um, using Makey Makey with kids and having sis holding sister's hands to be able to complete a circuit. So you still, at least you have other people in your house you can, you can use Makey Makey with. Good point. Yeah. Or pets, um, if, or they'll pets. Co if they'll cooperate. What's the masks? Pets are actually really fun to try that with. I um, did the what is conductive lesson with a student virtually. And um, that was the thing she did. She went, will my cat work? And she tried one cat to bridge the circuit. And that cat did great. It totally works. But her second cat had a lot of furry toes, like had too much fur on the toes. Insulation. Not yeah, and then, That's and then couldn't do it. So yeah, so because you're completing a circuit when you use Makey Makey, you're kind of learning more than one thing. You're learning about circuitry and you're learning about coding. All right, so Eric has to tell us about Scratch. Oh my gosh, Scratch. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, Scratch is a um, online creative community uh, and coding environment for kids around the world to make their own interactive games, animations, animated stories. It's a very powerful tool. One really important thing about it, as you can see in this picture, is that instead of text for coding, you use visual blocks. Um, where are we going from here? Am I gonna do the project? Show Scratch and do a little Scratch thing if you want, or, we, or I can just show this Craft and Code project. I can demo this. He was gonna... Uh, you were going, Lauren, he was going to share his screen and show us a little walk around on Scratch, yeah. a little demo. Scratch. Why don't we do that? Then I can stop okay. sharing my screen and, yeah. and take over, Eric. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. I love the humming sounds. I feel like this is a, a Zoom thing, too, that you learned more <laughs> about everyone. Like you have the kid interrupting in podcasts now, but now you can also <laughs> have the. What are the sounds you make when you go from one task to the next? Okay, so hopefully you're seeing um, my Scratch screen now. Um, and one cool thing is this tutorial window that pops open when you first load it. With Scratch, you can make your own stories. And so then we've got some dinosaurs. So that's a, a really short video that just shows some of the wonderful things you can do with it. But I'll, I'll show a tiny bit live. Um, so first of all, we have this cat here. Let's put in Amon instead, since we were discussing that. There he is, wow. Okay, so we have this Amon sprite. Um, 
and we have these graphical blocks to code him. So I can just click on them to try them out. So I'll click turn, it makes them on turn. Pretty sweet. I've got this go to random position block. I can click on it and he'll go to a random place or I can even <laughs> glide to a random place. Wow, that's fun. Um, Eric, he's doing it too, for real. Um, Amon is also you're, gliding. I, oh, you're coding so real, Amon. <laughs> I'm gonna make him walk. <laughs> on his flying. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so, what if I want to make interactive Amon? Let's go to um, events. And now when I sp press the space key, I'm going to make my blocks a little bigger so you see. When I press space, Amon will go negative 20 steps backwards. Um, here, let's add another one. When I press the right arrow, we'll move forward 20 steps. So now I have a keyboard controlled Amon. And I'll just do one more thing really fast, which is to add a sound. So I've got this play sound pop block. So hopefully you're hearing pop sound. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, ah, oh, that's pretty cool. But we'll switch to the sound tab and click choose a sound at the bottom left here. Now there's a whole library of crazy sounds, including the wacky category. That's my favorite. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's get the pluck sound. I can edit the sound here if I want to. I can make it like um, faster. Whoa, or slower. Um, so that's my pluck sound. And now it shows up right in my block here. So I can click on that to test out my sound, but I can drop it right in my program. So now when I press the space key, huh, it's not quite the sound of a mon dancing. So you can see my project needs some improvement, but that's, that's just the beginning. We'll do one more thing, which is add a backdrop. We have a whole library, but I guess since he was moonwalking, we'll get the space category, click on the moon. Nice. There we go. A modern space. Okay. That's a tiny scratch on. intro. Any questions or requests up to there? A small step for scratch. <laughs> One giant leap for a mod. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. And I will take that go over here. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm moving my camera. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, one way that I really like using Scratch. And I've seen a lot of educators use Scratch um, together with Makey Makey, and that's crafting and coding interactive posters. And so this is actually a project that um, I did during the pandemic that is based on Story City, where you actually have the students um, create their own story city. So I actually uploaded that as the backdrop on Scratch. And I know the light's a little hard to see, but that's probably because of the drawing. And then hopefully you can hear it when I tap. This is the apartment of Malia and Londa. Malia always wanted to live in a brightly colored building in the city overseas. Her daughter, Londa, loves living here because she can go downstairs and see her friend that lives in a houseboat. Londa also loves to play tricks on her neighbors. She leaves little notes outside their doorways with small trinkets she made. She likes to pretend the notes and gifts are left by a small apartment elf. And I like this part because uh, you can actually do animation. Oh, might be able to see the on the second floor of the building. All day long, while the pup waits for its owner, it dreams of being an astronaut. On sunny days, it dreams of flying on a rocket ship, but on other days, it looks out the window and sees dogs helping humans. On those days, it dreams of growing up to become a rescue dog because it dreams of something awesome to help the community. All right, and so you can, I'm going to switch my audio back to my other audio because it might be hard to hear me in this one. But this can be as simple as just coding sound, right? But we did a little animation so that it shows the rocket ship animating and changing costumes. And that's just a really quick project. And I'll put the link in here. That's not one of our Hour of Code ones. I just wanted to throw it in. That was my extra project. So now we need to go back to the slides and move to the real Hour of Code. But this is like one of those places lots of teachers really love to just start with Makey Makey is doing sounds. And so that's kind of segues into our collaborative sound art project and i'm so good i have i can move my demo watch this ta-da it's a whole <laughs> new demo did it work 
I had to like spend half the day getting this this ready here. Um, Ooh, so, Colleen, we had a question about that. How to how yeah. to uh, connect Makey Makey to the iPad? What adapter are you using? Oh yes. Um, so this is this is a new thing that w started working in like April. This is the camera adapter, and it works better with newer Makey Makeys. I do have one. Um, I do have one iPad adapter that's actually off brand that works with all Makey Makey versions. But the Apple adapter works better with like 1.4 and up. I don't know why. So um, I think it has to do with the power requirements. But yeah, it it, it, it yes. actually does have to do with the power requirements, Eric, because it says it has too much. It takes too much power. So there's something about the other adapter that doesn't that doesn't do that. So this is a really weird idea that we kind of all had together. We kind of brainstormed this idea as a group, uh, making something collaborative. And I really liked the idea of having students remix projects. So this is an, a project that, in fact, I'll, I guess, well, I was about to put it back on my own face because it feels weird talking where you only see the other thing, but it's okay. Uh, we liked the idea of students remixing projects. So it's something I've kind of been tinkering with during um, the pandemic time of being at home and, and kids are, are, and I actually see my own daughter using remix a lot in what she calls art competitions. Like she's constantly doing art competitions and remixing projects. So I thought it would be fun to make collaborative sound art. So you can actually record your sounds right in Scratch. Um, I actually used an app called Online Voice Recorder because I was able to choose a different microphone. And then they're making sound art. So we did a webinar last year with Mike Mitchell where students made sound art. And that the idea of sound art is just art from sounds. Right? So actually I am going to come back to my own screen because I want to show you this. One of these sounds that we're going to do today is from marbles rolling around in a bowl. In a bowl. So like, it's just a weird sound, the sound of marbles rolling. And uh, the other sound that we did is actually, oh, there it goes. Hear it in my Beats microphone. Um, the other sound that was really interesting was a water bo bottle rolling across leaves. So the idea is the kids are all in their own room. And this can work if you're not virtual too, but this is like a virtual specific idea. And in I, as a teacher, make the project with my sound. And then I tag a student on my project to make their, their sound. And they add their sound to the project. And then the next student remixes and adds their sound. And the next student remixes and add their sound. And then what we end up having is a collaborative project where, sorry, a collaborative project where all the sounds are connected in one collaborative sound art. Oh no, the thing happened I didn't want to happen where I had to put in my idiot's passcode in front of you. <laughs> oh, my camera still didn't go, so it's okay. <laughs> I guess I didn't start, oh good, you didn't see my idiot's passcode. Whew, safe. All right, so one thing too that I like to do sometimes is hold earth because sometimes kids forget about um, how they're going to do it. Sorry, I'm like all kinds of connected here. So I'm going to play my sounds and I had the students actually after they make the sound, they come up with an onomatopoeia word for it. Oh no, we can't hear it. I knew this would happen sooner or later. Do you have this problem often in Scratch with the iPad where the sounds don't play, Eric? Sometimes they have to refresh and then it works because that's what seems to happen. Um, At a higher level. Oh, there during, it goes. It went. Yeah, during, and you have to refresh. During an hour of code, it is uh, likely that you run into some of the nuances and the bugs in coding and everything too. And that's part of the whole community. So even within an hour, you can get exposed to things like what's your experience and quirks and nuances and the things that endear people to the coding community. And it, actually, I think debugging is important. I think maybe you also, it's playing now, but I don't know if you can hear it. So, so tell me if you can hear the, the sounds. I like heard a crunch. Weird yeah, it's a weird sound. Like, <laughs> and then thud is just small. And then this also, this project has a virtual making making, which you can't tell on that screen. So um, I can share out in my screen if we want in a second. Actually, let me do that. Oh, Leon said she could hear it, so I feel better. Um, I've made this virtual making making that shows what key press is being pressed. So all your students are going to know what key press they're pressing and how it connects and if it's connecting to making making whether they have one or not. 
And that's the idea. So the, I think the important thing here for teachers is this would actually, this will be somewhat of a teacher organized thing where you're going to have to tag the kid and then on the next project, you're going to want to tell them to do it. Um, in fact, can I share my screen real quick to show? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. I'm going to have the right project. Then, so. While you're doing that switch, I also want to highlight seasonal sounds. We, at the intro to the webinar, we talked about Thanksgiving seasons and you can have like pulling a chair out from the table, fork on a plate sounds. I like that. Uh, things like that you know so hour of code may happen around this time of the year but if you're doing coding in other times you have fun smacking a pumpkin sounds for october that's, uh, sounds that's like, leaves you know so, like animal crossing in animal crossing you only have certain plants during the right certain times of year i don't know if you know that if you play animal crossing um so on this project anyone can actually take my project and i'll put the link in there and use it that way to start because mine only has the first sound um and then ask students add their sounds. So they're going to put their name, their sound and their name. So I need to put mine because I didn't do it. And then I ended up getting tagged on the next one, right? So here's the second one uh, by Chicken Coop. And then Chicken Coop has added um, her rolling marbles and the sound, right? And then as the teacher, Oh, well, I actually made my child go to the next one, so I don't have the remix comment there. But as a teacher, I went in and commented on the next couple to get more sounds going. Um, and then you might end up, end up wanting to have a Google spreadsheet just to keep track. But that's the very strange collaborative sound art project with Scratch and Makey Makey. And I kind of like the whole onomatopoeia aspect with drawing the word out. It's really fun and adds that English language arts element. That's super fun. And the next project I think Eric is going to talk about. Um. <laughs> and we have to all do it. We're all doing it? Okay. Okay. Right? Um, I'm just seeing a chat message from Joanna that with a picture of me from the Scratch conference a couple years ago. That's great. <laughs> um, really nice to see that. Um, so I'm going to share the interview anything um, project. So as I'm talking, just pick up something from your desk. I have um, these a thing of peanuts here, for instance, or roll of tape. And um, you might wonder, what's it like to be that thing? What questions would you ask it? Um, so this is the theme for the interview anything uh, project that we created for um, Scratch at Home, which was an initiative last spring um, where uh, we came up with with just a lot of projects for kids to do um, with Scratch um, at home. Um, let me just quickly share my screen here. Do, 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 do. You're going to share your screen now? OK, I will stop sharing. Wait, don't we all have to grab something to and make and think of what it's going to say? So, yes, so while I'm Are getting set up. Play? Yeah, while you do that, we're going to do that. We got we to gotta find something that we're going to interview and think about what it would say and what we want to ask it. Oh my gosh. I have a light switch. I think that I want to ask the light switch how it's feeling during COVID. If it feels left out or feels like people don't want to touch it anymore or say hello to the light switch. Um, <laughs> got some flyers here. If the light switch feels like entertained with all the ideas people have to turn it on without using their hand. What will the lock say, Amon? Oh, the lock, uh, I hope that it would tell me the combination because it's been long forgotten. But I could also ask it what its favorite number is or how it feels that time that it was left out in the rain on the trailer. And, uh, you know, does it like the Boston weather? Oh my gosh, Eric, this would go great with the, um, the day the crayons quit. This is actually a great literacy tie-in because the mm. day the crayons quit is all about crayons and the second one is even better because it's all of the crayons telling him where they've been lost. The, I don't remember what the second one is, but they're what it's called. It's got a different name, but there's like Esteban. There's a P green decides it's going to go with Esteban. And he was like, you left me out here or I'm leaving. And he tries to leave the house. And then he's like, it's raining. I'm staying in. So that would be great for interviewing. Interviewing a crayon would be fun. So here's the interview anything studio that we created. So Scratch has this idea of studios that are collections of projects that kids can submit their project to. 
Um, and we have hundreds of interviews with different things on here. Here's an interview with air or um, interview with looks like some cheesy puffs, interview with a star, but it's just an actual star. Um, so kids got really creative with this interview anything prompt. So I'll show you um, the product that I created initially. This is just like a minute long uh, interview with part of a banana peel. Okay, welcome part of a banana peel. It's great to have you on the show today. Uh, okay, so tell me part of a banana peel. What's it like being part of a banana peel? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I did not know that. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much. Part of a banana peel. And please tune in next time. Um, so that was just one of the examples. But like, here's a project made by a kid. Um, in that case, you know, I actually took pictures of a banana, an actual banana peel and animated it using Scratch. But this is a different approach that just uses the say block. Um, to make words appear on the screen. So this person is interviewing, interviewing a fish. How does it feel to be a domestic fish? Sad to not be swimming free. Oh, dark interview. Who is your owner? Mr. Banana Pants, he eats underwear for dinner. We're gonna pause this interview. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, here's one um, where uh, the person recorded their own voice, kind of like I did, but it's an interview with the actual scratch cat. Hello, sorry about the I'll start that we had with the other scratch cat. Oh yeah, I hate that guy. It's all right. His disguise was pretty convincing. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, what's your favorite thing about your job? I love to be in everybody's project and see how creative they get. So that's a really sweet idea, just the scratch cat loving to be in people's projects. And you could hear um, the kid, I think, was voicing both the interviewer and the cat. That was, that was very cute. Um, so let's see. Uh, and just one more. Uh, this is made by a teacher. It's an interview with a 3D printer. Hello, it's Amy Bojangles here, and I am with a 3D printer that um, Mr. Gross has been using. And um, it, this 3D printer has been up to something very interesting. Um, hello, uh, 3D printer. Um, can you uh, can you tell me what you've been up to? Well, first of all, Amy, thank you very much for having me on. Um, so I won't show the rest of that, but it's it's pretty interesting. It shows a lot of, of cool ideas. Um, and maybe I'll pause there. I think a lot of people talk to their cars every day, especially in Boston during the winter. Come on, please start up. <laughs> you can do this. Totally. <laughs> I, I love how you can make your own sound, like your voice louder or lower and higher, because I always hate my own voice. So I, I, I appreciate that. What those mm -hmm. kids do. And you can make up your own languages, like with this mm -hmm. banana peelish actually like, for example, sir, and you kind of imagine what he's saying this could be, make it even a better language arts prompt where you can't the kids code it and then another kid has to write what he's actually saying what that banana saying i really like making people slip when they step on me <laughs> <laughs> that's great all right, and uh, before we go into two more activities, uh, we'll give you a quick intro on splats. Got one right here. Amon, do you wanna, <laughs> he's got a whole stack of them back there. We'll let him, Amon was the co-inventor uh, co of splats, so we'll uh, let him introduce what they are. All right, well, uh, as you see, these little guys called splats are meant to be used in uh, more than one in number so that you can do interactive things because when you turn them on, they're battery powered. You can hear that they have a speaker. You can see that they have lights. So they light up, they make sounds and they react to you stepping on them as the animation on the screen is showing. So what you can do when they're connected with an app is you can make these things that are durable enough to go on a gym floor or a classroom floor or any corner of your house floor or the wall via the hangers. And you can make people do a little bit of coding on the app that comes with it to make their own relay races, dance games, and other interactive experiences that use some code but are meant to be enjoyed and explored on your feet. So one of the early ideas are to 
was to capture the fun that people have from playing games on the playground, such as tag. And even in the chat, if you have seen any variation of the game tag, like freeze tag, tunnel tag, graveyard tag, add any of your favorite tags, you see people taking a set of rules and changing those rules, but they're doing it in a social environment and they're doing it while they're running around and they're playing. So through the unruly splats process, I learned about toilet tag and all sorts of other uh, fun variations, but we wanted to take this idea and have people be playful and be on their feet, but doing coding. So the splats have a set of graphic like blocks inspired by the scratch um, blocks that Eric demoed. And this can be done in on Chromebooks or on iPads and over Bluetooth connections, you can program one to 12 splats um, to do any of the games that you can imagine. And they communicate across a far space where you can have things in the corner of the classroom and play games like Four Corners, where people are running around the classroom and you say, if you land on purple, you're out. But they don't know what color is going to appear on the splats um, at any given time. So that is what a splat is. It is a distributable across the classroom device that you can step on and you can program over Bluetooth. They're battery powered and they are uh, very durable. Our school success director loves to say the rules for the game are the rules for the code. And it really just helps you think about like in its most simple way, you know, how does this game work? And that really helps at least me understand, okay, where do I start with the code now? Uh, but you'll see we also have virtual splats here on the iPad on the left hand side, you can see the splats. Uh, and so the two games that we're about to uh, play are fully virtual. So you could do them with your students virtually, or you could also do them if you're in person or hybrid, uh, you can also do it with them uh, in that way as well. Very flexible. So I'm just going to show a quick video of how it works. Uh, we actually just filmed this the other week. So I'm excited to show it to you guys. I don't know how many of you caught the cameo from our CEO's uh, Corgi, <laughs> but she does make an appearance. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Next slide. All right, but as we said, um, you don't need physical splats to enjoy the fun. So let's. We we have um, been in a constant process of improving the app. As Eric pointed out on his sweatshirt, Scratch has gone through three major revisions, making it to 3.0, where you get to add features. The Unruly web app and the iPad app is also evolving. And we're on 2.0, in which we have a more robust system of incorporating virtual splats and um, opportunities for people to have a lot of the fun that they would have using the physical splats. And, but being able to experience them without necessarily having uh, the physical splats with them or the people that they're sharing their projects with, where you can use the virtual splats to play some of these interactions. And what are the new, um, new features of the new app? I think one of my favorite ones is being able to save your games to the cloud yes. so that teachers can access their students' work from anywhere, all in one place. That was something that we heard a lot from teachers that was um, a hot request. And splats are, the, the model of splats typically is uh, sets of a dozen or so, whatever multiple of 12 go into typically a school environment and people have access to them there. However, the apps, um, the web app and the iPad app are free to download so that they can be enjoyed outside of those contexts. All right, so we're gonna play a game. I'm pretty excited about it. It's called Monster Maker. Uh, and while I pull it up, Aman, do you want to walk through how it works? Okay, so we're going to be doing uh, something that incorporates the ethos of uh, the unruly splats, which is 
a little bit of code and a lot of collaboration with other people. So you don't need to be doing an hour of code. It doesn't need to produce millions of lines of code. That's not the merit badge that we're trying to get people to learn. We try to do as much with as little code as possible. In this example, we're gonna use a little bit of code which is going to give us inspiration. So the pe three people that are drawing this monster maker activity are Colleen, Eric, and myself. We're each gonna take this code that Lauren is gonna walk you through and we're gonna get inspiration for uh, parts of the monster because we're going to take different sounds that pop up and we're going to draw the head, torso, and the bottom of a creature that are inspired by different random sounds. Anyone who knows me knows that I love random blocks and things and computers choosing random things for me. So this is one of the programs that takes advantage of that feature. So while uh, Lauren sets it up, we're going to be busy uh, getting our behind the scenes arts going. Yes, I got really excited. So, uh, but before we, we go into the code, uh, I'll just show a quick example. So this was one that we did uh, with our bootcamp uh, with our customers and um, there was a little confusion around it, but I think that's the fun of it. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can make mistakes, you can be silly. This activity is all about being silly. Um, so hopefully you guys can see my screen here. It doesn't quite match up. These lines in each of the boxes are supposed to line up with the head, the middle and the, the bottom of the monster. Um, but this is some examples of what it could look like um, <laughs> when everyone's on the same page. So I'm going to exit out. So basically what would happen and what's going to happen is uh, Aman, Eric and Colleen are all going to mute themselves. They're already muted. And they're gonna run this code. And it's gonna create a random animal sound, which we're not gonna hear. And Aman is gonna draw the head. Eric is gonna draw the body, the middle, and Colleen is gonna draw the bottom of their monster. And all of them are probably gonna get different animals. And that's the fun of it. And they've got 30 seconds here. So we have a variable here of drawing time, 30 seconds uh, to draw their project. And they're gonna do it in a Google doc, which I'm just gonna show you right here that looks like this. And so this is something that you could give to your students and they're going to double click in here and use the scribble tool to scribble their monster. Um, I'm not going to save that. <laughs> I'm going to exit out of there. Oops. I will give you a new box. And so the fun part is you, there's a reset box at the bottom. So I can just reset that. So Aman has a fresh Thing to start off with. So I'm going to run the code just so you guys hear it. Uh, but when I press go, everybody else is also going to run the same code. And then we're going to see what the monster looks like. All right. Ready? Okay. So I got a lamb sound. And I'm not participating in the drawing uh, half because we only have three people who are going to be doing it, but also because I really suck at drawing. <laughs> You definitely wouldn't be able to tell what my uh, what my monster was, but that's also part of the fun. So they've got 30 seconds and when the, the code hits or the timer here, you can see it going off counting down. When that hits zero, you're going to hear a buzz sound. All right, time's up. I know it's short. <laughs> so if you're done. We're going to go into our... I did mine. <laughs> Ooh, oh, I like it. What is the... What is We're that? We're just waiting for Amon to finish his masterpiece. <laughs> I can tell it's going to be good. <laughs> I can't tell what that is. What the middle is supposed to is be. It, I think the bottom is a horse. Yes. Nice. And the middle... Uh, I had it easy because all the middle was hooves. <laughs> I don't know what that is. It Eric, looks like it's it's maybe like, it's a centaur or something like maybe a yeah, an alien with a space <laughs> on its stomach. Well, and I'm had, not quite sure what a monster is. <laughs> I had a tricky situation because the sound was just like, <laughs> so I thought it's maybe a it's a pig, and I was like, how do you draw like only the middle part of a pig? So I draw, tried to draw kind of like hoof arms, and then I was like, well, wait, maybe it's got shorts on. And I put a t-shirt on, but I was like, wait, we want to see the belly button, and then I put a I like face it. on the shirt. It was it was a oh, it's a, a shirt. Thirty seconds, but I got there, you know. Wow. He really went in all in on that one. <laughs> like and, and someone asked uh, if the presentation will be shared and we'll also share this activity uh, with you as well. Uh, but if we go back into the code, um, this is what it looks like. It's very similar to Scratch and the same thing with 
uh, with Scratch, I'll disable this block just so I can give you a little tour as well. Uh, there's two ways to start a program always. Uh, you're either pressing the splat or you're starting the program. And so if you're not using physical splats, uh, you don't have to connect anything, but if you are using physical splats, then all you have to do is click this here and then turn on your splat and then that'll appear via Bluetooth. And then it lights up green and we know it's connected. So when splat one is pressed, let's say I'm gonna light splat one with green. I want some scores on here. So this is like a, even a very simple voting machine. You could duplicate this and then make this splat two if I had two splats connected. I'm gonna disconnect this for now. And then this would be a super simple voting machine and you can light the splat red. And so now when we light this, press the splats, we can add some sounds because sounds are fun. Heard the animal sounds, but I'm gonna raspberry. All of the kids always find raspberry. Like the, that's the first thing that they find and it's great. The whole games have been designed around the raspberry sound. So, oops, I have the bug in my code. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how that works. I love it. You could actually do this in Scratch too. And that's kind of a fun co hour of code idea anyway, is to, to try in both lands. And uh, using random in Scratch, I was going to say when Eric had it up earlier, like I like to choose random sounds and random characters. Sometimes it's inspirational. So I love the, the random animal sound that made me draw horse feet. It was very yes. easy to do. Yeah, so fun. And fitting for the coming from Scratch with uh, the Scratch cat, what the top, the head was actually supposed to be a, a cat head. Cause that's what Wait, I, go back, Lauren, and show the listeners. drawings again. The head was supposed to be a cat? Yeah, so I was I was struggling to get the whiskers in there, but you can also, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is an abstract art, but if I get enough whiskers, maybe people will figure it out. But the oh, really it. really <laughs> it's such a cool way to play exquisite corpse. Yes. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, you can change the colors. Ooh, I didn't. Know I was that. trying real hard to find a fill. Like, I could not find a fill. I was like, where's fill? I want to fill these in. Couldn't find it. By the, by the end of the month, we're all, all going to be experts in uh, Google Scribble. <laughs> I, it's really fun, especially because you're doing both. I know teachers love to, to bring Google back in. And it's something they can actually turn in, you know, or, or share with the class. So, Yeah, absolutely. And collaborative, which is great. Mm -hmm. One of the principles from um, Scratch was keeping the number of block primitives that the commands, the entire ecosystem of commands that are there manageable and that is because there are a lot of languages where there are a great many things one can do the hour of code um, is just the tip of the iceberg because coding has a great many things that one can do but in the environments that we are normally featuring it's the blocks gives you a small a manageable palette of things that have a lot of applications uh, from sounds to art and um, and gives you the core computational things like looping and and with the splats app we uh, are tuned to this piece of hardware and what it can do so there's more of a, a curated experience of blocks that you know you're not going to get a whole lot of other things and a lot of um, interference you know you want you have enough to play with in the spaces that this device can do so uh, one of the key things is to make sure that you're offering um, things that are random so that you can explore the space and but not put too many blocks in the palette so that you people can really explore and find what everything means and so um, you know that's one of the things that just the, the whole blocks languages have done you don't have to remember you don't have to have the cognitive load of memorizing all of the and be able to type what the commands are you can see them all but you still need to be able to browse so it can't get too unwieldy so that's been one of the things between most of the blocks language communities is that uh, principle and that makes them really conducive for hour of code because you can really explore but not get too lost and, and lose track of things. Exactly and that's the perfect segue into our next activity which also uses randomness, uh, the found art challenge. So how this activity works is that it's really really fun uh, to do at home. It's one of the most popular ones we've heard from our uh, educators uh, where the splat will light up a random color 
And then you have, uh, I think it's 20 or 30 seconds to go grab something in your house that's that color and then bring it back to your desk. And it's going to do that three or four times. And then by the end, uh, you're going to have enough items that you can build a sculpture. So here are some of the ones that we've seen. Look at those hands. Make. <laughs> And important to know, if, you know, of, of course, um, you know, only grabbing things that the parents will, will allow them, not the most expensive vase in the house or anything like that. But uh, is we've that seen a that sweet potato? That's it a sweet is. Potato. It is a sweet potato. And it looks That's like a, a whisk. Yeah. In a tiki, tiki shot glass, possibly. <laughs> 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 this is a... a 21 plus uh, art sculpture on the left. <laughs> All right, so I think I know we're running, we're running low on time, but let's see. I can just basically show you how it works in the code here. So it's doing 20 seconds and let's see how many rounds it's repeating. Okay. All right, let's try it. Okay. So. Twenty, nineteen, eighteen. And you'll see the countdown. Seventeen. <laughs> Sixteen. What am I supposed to get something at once? Fifteen. Yellow or orange? Fourteen. Okay. Thirteen. Huh. Twelve. Okay. Yellow. Eleven. Just ten. <laughs> nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. I got orange. Three. Yellow two. One. All right, now oh. we have to grab something. <laughs> and that would just <laughs> and that would just repeat four times. And then you would uh, create What's your the next color? Let's run it again. Looks like we get two colors. Uh, green or green. blue? Green or blue. Yeah. 20, 19, Just kidding. Purple. 18, <laughs> 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Two. Oh yeah, I see it. One. I was gonna use this. Is this purple? All right, let's do it one more time. Twenty. Red. Nineteen. Red. Yeah, Eighteen. That's easy. Seventeen. Sixteen. I'm making my sculpture. Fifteen. Fourteen. I'm not allowed to start. Thirteen. Yet. <laughs> Twelve. No, it's my last Eleven. Oh. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Oh my gosh. Six, five, I'm also working on my four, too early. three, two, one. Pencil. All right, now I think you press slot two here and it's gonna count down from 60. So we have 60 seconds to make our sculpture. All right, so I've okay. wrapped my red thing around here. Mine's pretty easy. It's not going to take 60 seconds, but. Yeah, this won't take 60 seconds because my things already look like a hat. I feel like I just decorated my strawberry. And you can, you can do it as many times as they can have five things or six things, but it's working in that randomness. Looks so cute. Lynn's uh, wearable. Oh, nice. You made a wearable. I'm yeah. trying. Oh, nice. I'm, oh, okay. I got mine to work. So. Has everyone done their sculpture? Oh yeah, we're done. Okay. Oh my gosh, Eric. So everyone show it off. I'm, mine is very delicate, right. so I'm gonna... I'm gonna try this. It's right, it's balancing. Ah, oh, you can't really see. Whoa, nice. Wait, I could do this. Oh. There we go. It's like a video it's filter. Balancing. Yeah, I'm making a filter based on your ideas. That's awesome. I can't tell how I look though. <laughs> Oh, I like your filter, Colleen. Cleaner. <laughs> you know, you can't really see mine, but it's balancing. Here, I'll see if I can actually lift it up. This, this seems risky. But I actually... Oh! 
No, it fell. It's a, um, a gravity detector. It always points That's nice. towards uh, the center. Of the we need to put the uh, videos of the participants back up and not the splat screen. Oh, they yeah. can only see the splat screen. Sorry, everyone. Screen. You missed us being very silly. Okay. So I have the top of a, of a Smurf house the, for the red here. And this Smurf is a Laker fan because they found something purple. And so they uh, only invite Laker fans in. And they're also a, a, a astronomer because this little yellow orange flashlight will be sort of a telescope out of their house. So. Amazing. Art. I think it, I like it. I really like Eric's because it's on his face. My, my yeah. kazoo is always available at a moment's notice. And I'm sure went crashing on. <laughs> okay, well, we are over time, so let's uh, move on to our key takeaways. All right. So we've already sort of. Uh, teased one of them, which is hopefully, um, you know, this is just some inspiration to get you started. It's hopefully it goes beyond uh, the hour, uh, but it's all about celebrating computing um, and celebrating missteps, celebrating silliness <laughs> and having fun. And making time, um, you know, we're talking about collaborating. The hour of code is usually something where it's like, you know, you make time and you can do things when other people are doing it so that you can talk about it and, and celebrate togetherness because in a time when we're apart. So the collaborative aspect we wanted to highlight is uh, getting at that. Absolutely. And really being playful with like the things that you have around you. You kind of see them every day and we might all be getting a little tired of our living rooms, but you can actually reimagine them in a new way and, and, and integrate them into your coding by, you know, you can, you, you saw Eric just using the, he used the background thing in Scratch to upload it as background. He can make it a costume. And we'll share all the links that we put in the chat for everyone um, in a blog post too, so everyone can see how to do those activities. And we were- <laughs> Say it, Mickey Mickey. Uh, the world is your construction kit. Yes, yes. Nice exactly. idea. Exactly. Everyone with the random sounds that are built into the splats, but there's also the ability to put your own sounds in the splats and put them around your house too. So, you know, you can go beyond um, what was there and you can uh, record your own things or, or have uh, the furniture or have the banana peels in your house record something. Exactly. The world is your oyster. And yeah, Colleen, absolutely right. You, you know, it's all about using the tools and the things around you in your house and, and making it open-ended so that, you know, students don't necessarily need to have every specific thing, uh, but they can just use the things that they already have around them in their house, which is all part of fun. Yeah, super fun. It's super quick ideas. All these things were definitely less than an hour of code, right, Amon? 